God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. He got all power. He knows all things. He is imminent among us, transcendent above us. He knows how to be where he is not and stay where he was. He is everywhere at the same time. He got all power. He's El Shaddai, Elohim, and Yahweh. He is Jehovah. He who was, is, and will be. He knows how to be everywhere even when he's not where you think he ain't. He know how to be in hell and never stop being heaven. Do I got anybody in here who testify? He got all power in his hand. And he's the only one that can handle everything at the same time. Numbers chapter 11. And I want to lift up this word that's in accordance today uh, with our consecration of our leaders, but prayerfully because it is the word of God and it is highly probable that many of you may in the future be in such position. This is a word that is applicable uh, to all of us as we hear and receive it in faith. Numbers chapter 11. I want to read this context uh, for you. A little bit of an extensive reading, but you'll get the foundation uh, of the word of the Lord that it may be uh, an aid to understanding what the word of the Lord is today. I want to begin reading at verse number one of Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11, verse number one. The Bible should read, and when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned against them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp, and the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched, and he called the name of the place Tabera, because the fire of the Lord burned among them and the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting and the children of Israel also wept again and said who shall give us flesh to eat we remember the fish which we, which we did eat in Egypt freely the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic but now our soul is dried away there is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes and the manna was as coriander seed, and the color thereof of the color of bedellium. And the people went about and gathered it, and ground it in mills, and beat it in a mortar, and baked it in pans, and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was as the taste of fresh oil. And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. Then Moses heard the people weep, throughout their families every man in the door of his tent and the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly Moses also was displeased and Moses said unto the Lord why have you afflicted your servant and why have I not found favor in your sight that you would lay the burden of all this people upon me have I conceived all these people have I begotten them that you should say unto me, carry them in your bosom as a nursing father bears the sucking child unto the land which you swear unto their fathers. Where should I have flesh to give unto all this people? For they weep unto me, saying, give us flesh that we may eat. I am not able to bear this people alone because it is too heavy for me. And if you deal thus with me, kill me. I pray you out of hand. If I have found favor in your sight and let me not see my wretchedness. And the Lord said unto Moses, gather unto me 70 men of the elders of Israel that you know to be elders of the people and officers over them and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation that they may stand there with you. And I will come down and talk with you there. And I will take of the spirit which is upon you and I will put it upon them and they shall bear the burden of the people with you that you bear it not yourself alone. Verse 24. 
And Moses went out and told the people all the words of the Lord and gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke unto them and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. I want to tag this text, the making of God's leaders. You may be seated in the Lord's church. The basis of all we believe in Christianity is centered solely and consistently on the character of God. And one of the basic attributes of God's character is that God is sovereign, that he possesses all power, absolute, and by him being sovereign, he has authority without accountability. Sovereignty means that God can act without answering to anything or anybody. He possesses all power. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. He's omniscient. He knows all things. He is ubiquitous. He does not change. He is immutable. He does not change. He is eternal. He never dies because he was never born. He is imminent means he's among us. He's transcendent means he's over us. And all of these attributes define him exclusively as the God who doesn't need help. He has no equal. He has no contemporaries. He cannot be vetoed. He cannot get a vote. He cannot be overturned. He never depletes in energy. He can release healing without ever losing power. He never stops being who he is. And because of his attributes, he does not submit nor cooperate with a league of other gods. He is not a part of a pantheon. He is not a member of a board. He does not participate in some kind of cosmic Council where there are multiple gods who handle various aspects of life and reality. This is not our God who is polytheistic in his participation. He is monotheistic. And whatever he needs, he already has. And whatever power he exerts, he never loses. He never has to seek counsel. He does not have to lay on anybody's couch. He does not have to have a therapist. He is the almighty El Shaddai. The etymology of El Shaddai means the mighty breasted one. The one who possesses all power. And as old as he is, he never gets old. And these attributes, ladies and gentlemen, are interesting for us because we're in our finite minds oftentimes trying to understand an infinite God, somebody who never started and never has an end. If there is a somewhere where God is not, then that is a nowhere that does not exist. God is everywhere at the same time. He is all things in all places. He created all things. He consists of all things. Before him was nothing. After him, there will not be an after him. And because of these eternal attributes about God, our God does not need help. Whatever he needs to do, he does it on its own. 
He doesn't need anybody to speak for him because when we met him, he was talking. He doesn't need anybody to create anything for him because he never has to work to create. He speaks and it comes into existence. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it introduces to us an intriguing aspect of why God calls anybody to do anything. Because if he does not need help doing anything, he has no point to call anybody to do anything. Whatever God calls you to do, he can do himself. And thus, ladies and gentlemen, we need to revisit the whole point and purpose of why God calls anybody to do anything because whatever he calls you to do, he can do without you. He calls us, ladies and gentlemen, not because he needs us. He calls us because he chooses for us to participate in his plan. <laughs> Whenever God wants to do something, he just picks who he wants to participate in his plan. And ladies and gentlemen, that's the whole purpose as to why you and I are used of God in any capacity because God doesn't need us. He is just choosing to use us as participants in his plan. It's not your agenda. It's God's. It's, it's not what you want to do. It's how God wants to use you. And as a result, ladies and gentlemen, may we revisit the whole purpose of why God uses anybody to do anything. This particular passage here in Numbers chapter 11 is a historical precedent of what God does and how God uses people uh, to participate in a plan more, more specifically to respond to a need. Would you peek your face here in Numbers chapter 11? The book of Numbers is not just about records of census with the children of Israel. The theological thread that runs through the book of Numbers as it is volume number four in the Pentateuch, this theological thread that runs through this book is the constant observance of God's faithfulness in relationship to the unfaithfulness of the people. That's really what this book is about. It's a, it's a diary of a good God to a bad people. Well, you just read in verses 1 through 6 there are two looming issues in this passage. You read that the people, verse 1, complained. Verse 2, they cried. Verse 4, they went a lusting and wept again. And they complained. Look at what they complained. Who going to feed us? But when we read the context again, Listen to what they said in verse 6. They said, who's going to give us flesh because all we got is this manna? I'm going to try it again because you're slow to respond. Who's going to feed us because all we got is this manna? I'm going to try it one more again. Who is going to feed us because all we have is this manna? Listen at that church. The complaint is not that they don't have something to eat. The complaint is that they're ungrateful about what they already got. I can't get no help in this church. 
complaining people are not people who are empty. They are people who are ungrateful about being full. You know some complaining people. It's not that their hands are empty. They just don't like what they already have, which means you can never satisfy complaining people because the minute they got something, they're not grateful for what they already got. Maybe that's an ungrateful section right there. So let me talk to some grateful people who will just thank God that I'm not complaining about what I don't have. I'm grateful about what I do have because it could be I couldn't have nothing would you take 30 seconds just to thank God about what you do have and stop complaining about what you don't have complaints the first problem with this text church the first problem with this text is that Moses pastors an ungrateful people and he is so frustrated with his church he'd rather be dead than to pastor these people I didn't make that up. It's right here in the text. He said, Lord, instead of giving me these people, kill me. I'd rather be dead than to have to pastor an ungrateful people because y'all act like it's some grocery stores out here. Ain't no grocery stores out here. You eat miracle food. And you mad about a miracle? Do I got anybody in here who understands a miracle means that nature couldn't get it? God gave it to me. I don't know about you, but I can stand another miracle. As many miracles as God want to give me. Would you, would you catch this church? They're in the wilderness for 40 years. Ain't no grocery stores out here. And God makes sure that they got manna the whole time they out there. Listen to what they said. They out there complaining because God has them on a diet. And he took them away from the buffet and put them on a diet. Listen to what they said. They said back in Egypt, you know, we had cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlic. Now you mad because God shifted you from a buffet to a diet. And you would rather eat the food of the enemy than to survive off of God's miraculous meal. Complaining. I wish more of y'all would have said amen. But if you a complainer, I know why you didn't say amen. Can't ever be satisfied. That's the first issue. First issue is they are a people of ingratitude but here's the second issue second issue church is that they have a leader who is inadequate I'm in the Bible I'm in verse 6 here it is Ver verse 10 11 and 12 here it is Moses goes and prays to God and says God this pastoring thing 
looks like affliction and burden. I'm in verse 11. That's what he called it. He said, God, why have you afflicted your servant? Pastoring people is an affliction. He called it a burden. He's not happy serving in his capacity. And he gets down to the real issue of his problem in verse 14. Listen to what he said. He said the real problem is not pastoring ungrateful people. The problem is I got to pastor them alone. I'm in verse 14. I didn't make that up. He says I can't bear these people alone. It's too heavy for me. So not only is he displeased, he's stressed. Because he's one man trying to take on too much. Y'all missed it, so let me give it to you again. Moses' problem is he's trying to be God. Y'all missed my introduction, so I'm going to try it again. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. He got all power. He knows all things. He is imminent among us, transcendent above us. He knows how to be where he is not and stay where he was. He is everywhere at the same time. He got all power. He's El Shaddai, Elohim, and Yahweh. He is Jehovah. He who was, is, and will be. He knows how to be everywhere even when he's not where you think he ain't. He know how to be in hell and never stop being heaven. Do I got anybody in here who testify? He got all power in his hand. And he's the only one that can handle everything at the same time. Y'all sleep. He know how to keep the planets in their sockets, the stars shining, and still heal your body where you at. He know how to look over people in Ethiopia and Jerusalem and be here in this church at the same time. He's the only God that can handle it all by himself. And when you try to handle everything by yourself, you going to find out you ain't God. That's why you own pills. That's why your hair falling out. That's why your blood pressure is up. That's why you gain and weight. That's why you evil as hell. Because you so busy trying to be God instead of stay in your place. Touch somebody tell them stay in your place. Let God be God. God is the only one who can handle it all and don't need no pills. <laughs> God is the only one who can handle it all and can go to sleep. My bad, he don't sleep. He can never be tired. He can never be fatigued and still handle it all. Sometimes leadership doesn't show how powerful you are. Leadership shows how weak you are. Leadership shows that you ain't got all power. You don't know all things. You can't be everywhere at the same time. And you need help. And so what God does. Look at what God does. Y'all don't like this side of God. God did not remove Moses' problem. He just gave him some help to deal with it. <laughs> you down there complaining? Guess what God said? I'm mad too. I, say, I understand how you feel. I'm mad too. I feed these jokers. They don't even know how to say thank you. 
I give them miracle every day. Every day they wake up and eat, it's a miracle. How dare you complain to me when every day you eat is a miracle? I'm sure you're mad with them because I'm mad with them too. But guess what? This is what we're going to do. I'm not going to remove your problem. I'm just going to give you some help to deal with your problem. And watch what God says. I'm in verse 16. He said, I need you to pick 70 elders of the people. When you get them, bring them to church. And they're going to have to, first thing they're going to have to learn to do is stand with you. <laughs> In my presence. And when they learn that, I'm going to take some of the spirit that's on you, sir, and put it on them. That they may bear the burden with you. I didn't make that up. That's in the Bible, ain't it? Walk with me through this process. This is, this is how God makes leaders. Number one, he says, select elders of the children of Israel. Did y'all see that in the Bible? All right, stop right there. Don't read no further. The text didn't say select 70 people. The text says select 70 elders. And because you all, y'all like the Bible a little bit at fellowship, you, you're interested to know who are the elders. Well, in the Jewish community, in the Old Testament, the elders were not specifically old people. Specifically in the Jewish community, the elders were equivalent to community leaders or arbiters. They held government positions and they were local magistrates. God, M Moses didn't go pick them. God told Moses to go pick them. So what does that mean? God told Moses to go pick people who are already demonstrating leadership. Because even God says to Moses, you need leaders who you don't have to train to be leaders. They need to already be functioning in leadership before they get a title. They are not entitled to get a title just because they've been serving forever. They ought to show signs of leadership before they get a title. Just because they've been on the ministry for 20 years and graduated with Abraham don't mean that they deserve a title because you can be serving and still never leading. See, just because you work well with paper and a computer don't mean you work well with people because people talk back. You think you entitled to a position just because you've been raising hell on that ministry for 30 years? That devil is a lie. You got to learn how to lead people and not processes. These are already people who show leadership skills prior to being put in a position. He said, go get folk who got leadership skills and not tenure. Listen, y'all can call me this week all y'all want to. Write as many letters as you want. I'm not changing this word to make you feel comfortable. 
because one of the cancers of the church is that we want to put willing people in leadership positions when they don't have leadership skills leaders move people and not processes You know, I've been on that ministry for two years, three years, and they keep overlooking me because you're a good worker. You're not a leader. <laughs> Go get people who already demonstrate leadership qualities. Because theologically, ladies and gentlemen, Lord, hold your boy right here. God has never called anybody that ain't already working. Come here, let me snatch you off your pew. Them 12 disciples, they were fishermen and tax collectors. They were already busy because the kingdom don't need lazy people. God doesn't use lazy people. He calls people who are already busy. Hey Val, I'm preaching good in this little robe, ain't I? I'm preaching pretty good, ain't I? I feel pretty good in this little robe. Here, let me tell you something. God don't want lazy just like your employer don't want lazy. I can't get no help on that side of the church. And you always want to raise, but you ain't doing nothing. You want to raise for just being here? Has never called anybody that wasn't already working. God deliver us from people who want to lead just so you can give some medicine to your insecurity. God deliver us from people who want to lead just because you want power that you ain't got at home. God deliver us from people who want a position and never want the responsibility that comes with it. God told Moses, my kind of leader is somebody who's already busy working. Who already demonstrates leadership qualities that can be transferred into the kingdom work. That's eligibility let the church shout eligibility the next thing the text teaches us church is about this issue of unity he said now go get those 70 elders and tell them to do one thing come stand before me with you I'm in the Bible, I didn't make that up. He said, he said, listen, before you give them an assignment, they gotta have an alignment. <laughs> they got to understand that there is no separation between standing before God and standing with the leader. Standing before God manifests itself in standing with who God stands with. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you can't be led of God and work against God's man. I knew you wasn't going to say nothing. You can't say you're following divine leadership and don't follow the man God has put to lead in his representation. They got to stand before you and with him. I 
I knew you wasn't going to say nothing. I don't care. You can't stand with God and stand against who God called. They are mutually agreeable. Can I get any help here? He said, bring them, bring them to the congregation, the tabernacle of the congregation, and let them stand before me with you. Secondly, that manifestation says, leaders also have to participate in worship. <laughs> One of the reasons why worship is so important is worship gets your spirit and your attitude ready for service. You watch those people who are mean at church. More often than not, they don't participate in worship. It's a common denominator that folk who are evil in church are not worshipers. The problem is they come to church to work, but they never worship. They got to go count money. They got to go stand in the parking lot. They got to go usher, but they never come inside and be a part of the worship. And thus they got a stank attitude, but the worshipers are happy and the workers are evil. But when everybody comes together and walks into the house of prayer and worships together, there is a joy and a spirit that carries over into service. They got to learn how to come to worship. And church is not just a place of work, it's a place of worship. Let them stand with you before me. Because the first thing they've been called to do is stand with Moses. That's the unity and the eligibility. But here's the empowerment. So when they come to church, they stand before you. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to give them my spirit. I'm going to give them your spirit. I'm going to take a degree and portion of your spirit, Moses, and transfer it on to them. Because their leadership is an extension of yours. <laughs> Lord have mercy today. There needs to be a union between Moses and these 70 leaders that when the people encounter one of them, they reflect Moses. I knew you wasn't gonna say nothing. See, if I got the joy of the Lord, you ought to have the joy of the Lord. If I'm free in God, you ought to be free in God. If the anointing rests on me, it ought to flow down to you. It is like the oil that ran on Aaron's beard and ran down to the skirts of his garment. You can't have anointing in the front and it's not in the back. Here's the problem. Here's the tension of the text, Gary. This is where I've been trying to get to. I've been talking just to get to this one point. Jefferson, good to see you. Good to see you, buddy. I've been talking just to get to this one point. The people God told Moses to gather comes from the complaining crowd. He didn't tell Moses to go get some outside folk. Them same people that you would rather be dead than the pastor. 
Go pick 70 out of that crowd. Because they got to understand that the best way for them to stop complaining is to put responsibility on them. See, you'll change your tune when you in the shoes of the very people that you try to criticize. Your whole message will change because now you get an idea of what it's like to have to lead ungrateful people. Which means those 70 people, those 70 people have been fired from being complainers. Because now you can't contribute to the problem. You got to be a part of the solution. You can't lead and complain. At the same time, you can't lead and cry at the same time, which means your leadership may one day cause for you to stand against some other people you know. Did y'all see how quiet that got? These 70 people are not a part of the continued complaint they have to partner with Moses to respond to the complaints. Did y'all hear that? Wasn't no clapping on that one. Cause in a church when you've been called to lead, it may call for you to stand against some other people in the church you love. Cause when you've been called to lead, you've been called to stand with Moses. Mm-hmm. Listen at that. We can't complain no more. Nope, you can't. You got to be a part of the solution now. You've been fired from being complainers. You've been hired to be a part of the solution. Here it is. Here it is. Their whole point of God calling them and says, and they will bear the burden with you so that you will not have to bear it alone. I want to pull some more things out this passage then we'll consecrate. Did y'all notice that when chapter 11 started God released fire and killed some of these people. And by the time we get to verse 16, uh, Robert Melvin, the same God that killed people, called people. From the same group of folk he killed. Y'all so sleep. You apparently didn't come to church to think today. When the chapter started, he killing some Israelites. By the time we get to verse 16, he calling some Israelites. And the folk he called was a part of the complainers. Well, y'all don't know when it could happen, so I shot myself. He is making clear to us, first of all, that the call is his choice. I told Moses to go call you. And I told him to go call you knowing I should have killed you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, to be called by God to do anything is a gift and not an entitlement. It is an act of God's grace that he uses you to do anything for him because he knows reasons why he should have killed you already. Anybody here got grace on your life? Somewhere between the wrath of God and the call of God is the grace of God. 
Call those same people. Tell them I want to use them. Tell them come before me. I'm going to place your spirit on them. I'm going to make them part of the solution even though they were once the problem. Ladies and gentlemen, when God uses you for anything, it is God's way of, of actualizing a perfect purpose through an imperfect person. Nobody is perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm just who God called. I don't get it right all the time. I'm just the one God called. And I'm going to make some mistakes in the process of doing what God called me to do. But guess what? Whether you like it or not, he still called me. These leaders going to make some mistakes in the process, but guess what? They have been appointed with the responsibility to actualize God's purpose in their lives for their ministry in light of their imperfections. The world don't struggle with grace, the church does. We preach it, but we don't practice it because we're so busy trying to be judges of other people. We're so busy trying to penalize folk so that the light never shines on us. If God's been gracious to you, you ought to be the first one to exercise grace on somebody else. Now you know they, 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 she don't even deserve to be up there. Look at him. He, he, I, I, he don't even, no, they need to get somebody. He ain't no good. I'm sorry, I just came to inform y'all. God knows how to make straight lines with crooked sticks. I thought I had some crooked sticks in here that would just thank God that God can take the wrong thing and do the right thing with it. This is an act of grace. I want to use the same people I got grounds to kill. <laughs> I'm done. There's the eligibility and the unity and the empowerment. I'm going to take some of my spirit and put it on you so that you are an extension of Moses' ministry and that when people encounter you, you don't just reflect God, you reflect Moses. Here's the final part of it, church. Here's the evidence that it happened. I'm in verse 25. Evidence says that when God, Moses went and told them people what God said, he selected those 20 elders, brought them into the tabernacle. Verse 25 says, and when he put some of Moses' spirit on them, they prophesied and did not cease. That word prophesied, church, means to speak under the influence. It means to sing under the influence. It means that these 70 elders, when they opened their mouth to lead, they were not leading out of the flesh. They were leading as the Holy Ghost led them and they were led by God's inspired power so that when they lead, their ministries knew that they were being led by people who are sensitive to God. God, help us to understand that when we lead in the Lord's church, we need to be inspired by God's spirit to lead so that the ministry accomplishes God's purposes and not our purposes. There ought to be some evidence that as you lead, you're being inspired. By God's power. I'm done when I tell you this. This assignment on your life and this assignment on the lives of all of us in here is only because of grace.
The reason why grace does not show up in the Old Testament because Jesus had not come yet. We see God demonstrating grace, but the actual doctrine of grace doesn't show up to the New Testament. After Jesus Christ gives his life, here is God's declaration for God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Grace starts what God's purpose will finish. I said grace will start what God's purpose will finish. Everyone standing.